There's been a lot of hysteria in the British and American press about what Putin is up to on the Ukrainian border. We've got to calm down. To understand the situation, we've got to look behind the walls of the Kremlin. Now, not all coverage has been hysterical. For example, here on YouTube, Johnny Harris made a thoughtful and beautifully produced video. But his video also misses the point. What nearly all Western observers miss is that what we're witnessing now is the slow end of the Putin regime as we know it. And that means, yes, Russia is moving to a post-Putin future. And yes, you should be scared. We're going to look at how this process has caused what's happened on the Ukrainian border and why such things are going to keep happening more and more and more into the future. Let's go. So let's think about what's going on. We've got this guy at the top, Putin, and we're going to talk about how his reign is slowly coming to an end and how that's causing the dynamic between Russia and Ukraine. But first, let's look at the man himself. What drives him? What worries him? I want to quickly tell you 15 things about Vladimir Putin, starting with the first, which is that he is obsessed with the speed of a nuclear strike against Russia. He can't stop talking about it. He goes on. And on. And on. So what does that tell us about Putin? Well, it nicely leads on to the second point. He is increasingly prone to paranoid and conspiratorial thinking. He sees American involvement everywhere, where it is present and where it is not present. He sees the Ukraine as a US puppet state when he is looking at democratic activation in the Ukraine. He thinks that's just American propaganda. When he looks at autonomous incompetence and autonomous corruption in the Ukraine, he sees State Department projects. And this paranoia has only got worse over the over 20 years that Putin has had in power. The third thing about Putin is that he has now got a sense of mission. When did he develop this? I think he developed it shortly before 2014, when Russia first annexed Crimea and got involved in eastern Ukraine. And Putin's sense of mission is now reaching a point where there is an identification between the man and, if you like, the destiny of the nation. There is an overlap between the will of a single individual and the collective historical self-realization of Russia. Four, this interestingly justifies Putin's palace and his luxury. Because he is not a narcissist, nor is he particularly greedy for material possessions. But there's a kind of lack of distinction in his mind between him and the state that's got to be luxuriously and symbolically presented. 5. Putin lies all the time. He can't stop lying, but he's not a pathological liar. So he's different to Donald Trump, who can't stably tell the difference between truth and falsehood, and who doesn't even have concrete beliefs. He has dispositional states that sort of blow about in the wind. Putin knows the difference between what's true and what's false, clearly, and he is not psychologically compelled to lie. He just lies all the time because he sees language 
as a political tool and he thinks it's strange and irresponsible not to use it strategically. 6. Putin is traumatized, and read my lips, I mean it, traumatized by the West's intervention in Yugoslavia and above all by the Kosovo war. He is generally emotional about the expansion of NATO, he is emotional about the war in Iraq, but above all he has a kind of trauma about what's happened in Yugoslavia that really has a hold over him that he can't control very well. 7. Putin is over-emotional. He doesn't let that force him into rash decision-making, but he spends a great deal of time feeling rage or indignation about a particular issue, and he just sits there simmering away. 8. Putin mistrusts, but he mistrusts in a particular way. He always looks for the personal motive in people's behavior, and he disregards the social motive and explanations in terms of values. So if a politician in the West is pursuing a certain project, Putin's straight away going to ask, how is that going to get that person more power or more money? And he's often going to ignore explanations about that person building something because they believe in it, because it accords with their values, or because it accords with certain wider social goals they're pursuing that are beyond their personal enrichment and their personal acquisition of power. So it's a kind of very corrosive and cynical mistrust that leads Putin to not actually be able to understand a great deal of human behavior. 9. Putin mistrusts the internet in a kind of magical way. So he doesn't really tell apart one bit of the internet from another. He thinks the internet as a whole is something to be mistrusted. And he gets information about what's going on on the internet in different physical multicolored folders that arrive from different agencies on his desk and he looks at them and compares the information. So if this video about him, which is critical of him, were to go spectacularly viral, he wouldn't watch it, but he would get a printout with screenshots, quote marks, and he'd spend a few seconds gazing at that. But he wouldn't go and watch it online. 10. Putin doesn't believe in political opposition. I'm not saying that he doesn't want to have political opposition. I'm saying he doesn't believe there is such a thing. He doesn't believe it's a meaningful concept. He thinks that there are allies and friends. He thinks that there are then enemies and foes. And then thirdly, he thinks there are traitors. But there isn't some other category that's political opposition that makes any sense to him. So Talking to him about political opposition is like talking to somebody who's come to a tennis match armed with a shield and a dagger. In other words, they're just refusing to understand that there's such a thing as engaging in conflict within a wider structure of cooperation with shared rules. 11. Putin is extremely pragmatic and extremely not pragmatic. His big ideas are rigid, conspiratorial, over-emotional in the way they have a hold over him, and not open to new evidence. But the way he goes about moving toward the realization of these ideas, he is extremely pragmatic, extremely open, and extremely patient. So he's completely flexible and open about means and completely rigid and often seemingly irrational about ends. 12. And this is interesting for a Western observer because you can't see it unless you understand Russian. Putin is amazing at impersonating people and taking on personas for the benefit of getting a certain result in a dialogue or in a conversation. 
So he can take on the persona of a human rights advocate for 45 minutes, so convincingly that only the most sensitive people will be able to see through the fact that it's an act. And so very often you have people meeting Putin, coming out of these meetings, thinking, is this, is this real? Did, did this actually happen? Did this conversation go the way it went? Because I know what Putin is like, he was nothing like that when he spoke to me. How do you put these two things together? And that's because he's actually very, very good at taking on particular roles and playing. 13. Putin loves legalistic language. He loves procedural and bureaucratic language. He sounds like he is in love with due process, even though the language of due process often masquerades completely ugly authoritarian edicts underneath. So how does this work? Well, let's take an example that's fascinating to Western observers, and that's the case of Putin's enemies ending up in the cemetery. Now, I think there are three ways in which this typically happens. Number one, some agency takes them out without a vertical requirement from the top, but clearly also without it being forbidden for them to do so. The second way this happens is actually against Putin's will. If an enemy of Putin is taken out and Putin wouldn't have wanted that to happen and actually if he could have stopped it, would have stopped it. And that arguably happened with the killing outside of the Kremlin of the wonderful opposition politician Boris Nemtsov in 2015, February 2015. But there is a third way in which this happens and that is when there is a requirement coming down vertically from Putin for somebody to be taken out. And this was the case with Alexei Navalny. So let's look at how Putin would have handled this. Putin never, across his entire career, would have been happy to have been caught saying, get rid of somebody and kill them. He would have used language like, let's open up a bit further the realm of possible measures that could be taken in this particular case. That would be the sort of thing he'd say, and he'd say just enough for the people in the room to understand what to do. In other words, you'd be left with the impression of thinking, well, did I just hear this or did I not? Did this, is this what, I mean, really? Because it doesn't, but it, but it, but it, mm, 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 and that is perfectly encapsulating of what Putin is like. You'd be having a, a, a sort of bird's eye view of that room and you wouldn't be sure if a killing had been ordered or if it hadn't been. And that probably is how it went down with Alexei Navalny with one proviso. And that's that it's not actually clear that Navalny's murder was ordered. It's plausible to think that they were thinking that Navalny might die might survive and be disabled, might survive and not be disabled, but get the point, get the message really given across to him. And all three possibilities were ones they were content with. That's actually even more brutal, perhaps, than going out to kill somebody in ethical terms, because they were kind of just indifferent as to whether he would die. 14. Putin's good. He is not an extraordinary world historical leader, but in stature, in talent, he is superior, let us say, to the majority of leaders of EU states. 15. Let's beat up on Johnny Harris a little bit. Johnny says that Putin is deeply attached to a sentimental vision of the spiritual and historical unity of Russia and the Ukraine. Bullshit. That's just not the case. Johnny gets there in part by reading a very long blog by Vladimir Putin, or rather a blog signed by Putin. Honestly, if you really want to understand the mind of Vladimir Putin and his whole view on this, you have to read this. On the History of Unity of Russians and Ukrainians by Vladimir Putin, a blog post that kind of sounds like a ninth grade history essay. The blog might have more than one author and the exiled Russian political 
analyst Andrei Piatkovsky has argued that the lead author of this blog is a guy called Alexei Chesnikov, who is a really unlovely Kremlin supporting sleazy political scientist. But that's less important than the fact that if you look at people who meet Putin and talk to him off the record about the Ukraine, they come out of these meetings with one word on their tongue, and that is territory. That's how Putin talks of the Ukraine. Territory. Look at the editor-in-chief of Echo Moscow, who has ongoing contact with Putin directly and indirectly, and is also genuinely really good friends with Putin's spokesperson Peskov. Venediktov says, for Putin, for Vladimir Vladimirovich, Ukraine is territory on which a war is ensuing between Russia and the United States. Putin is committed to this territory not drifting toward NATO and not drifting toward democracy. Putin is sentimental about many things, but on the whole, the union of Russia and Ukraine in spiritual and historical terms isn't really one of them. Putin does think that Ukraine and Russia are the same people, and he does think that the collapse of the Soviet Union is the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Here's him saying it. And an offshoot of that is he does find it weird that Ukraine and Belarus aren't part of the same country as Russia. The other ex-Soviet states he doesn't really care about. But while he is a sentimental man about many things, his sentimentality about the union of Russia and the Ukraine doesn't go anywhere near as deep as you might think. It's territory in which he is terribly pragmatically interested. So now we've got Putin and we've got the conversation to come about how he is losing power and the regime is in a period of transition, how that's impacting the crisis with Ukraine. But before going on to that, we've got to say what kind of regime the Russian regime is. And I want to give you both a definition of it and then a kind of visual analogy of how to think about it. And the definition is twofold. The Russian regime is a hybrid regime. And by hybrid, we don't mean that it's a bit of both, that it's 80% authoritarian like China and 20% democratic like Denmark. No, it's neither. It's a regime that isn't authoritarian, but imitates authoritarianism. And it's a regime that isn't democratic, but imitates democracy. So you can think of the Russian regime as being an 85% imitation of China and a 15% imitation of Denmark without really being either. So the Russian regime is a hybrid regime, but it is also what we call an informational autocracy. And what we mean by that is that information and control over information isn't for the regime a way of justifying its goals and projects. It doesn't have goals and projects beyond controlling the informational environment. Control over the informational environment is the goal of the regime. These definitions have three consequences, two of which we've already implied. One is that the regime prefers impersonation to reality. Take an example. What kind of wars does Putin like? Putin likes the kind of war whereby you look at it and you don't know if it's a war or not. A war where you look at it and it's damn clear that it's a war is informationally harder to manage. You can't just declare victory without any facts changing. You can't just remove it from the news cycle without citizens knowing. The second consequence is the regime's authoritarian repressive behavior is delimited and pointillistic. It's delimited insofar as the regime is always watching out for not going too far against 
strongly held public opinion. Look, for example, at how careful the Kremlin is at doing something they want to do, which is suppress the Internet. And when repressions happen, they are bitty or pointillistic. A thousand people might do something that the regime disapproves of, but only four will be picked on for punishment. And they might have their bank accounts frozen, they might be put on some kind of terrorist list, they might be put in jail. But the other majority of the thousand will be allowed to get on with their lives uh, unless they're unlucky to be caught the next time round. The third consequence is crucial to understand, and that's that the regime is not aiming to persuade its citizens of its positions, its views, its values. The opposite. The aim of the current regime in Russia is not to convince the population of its ideology, as was the case with the Soviet Union. Its aim is to confuse the population. And the benefit of confusion is apathy. So the Soviet regime wanted persuaded, ideologically straightened up, engaged citizens. This regime wants citizens without clear views, citizens who are informationally confused and consequently apathetic. But what about the visual analogy for the regime? What does that look like? Well, here it is. Imagine a board of a corporation that's amalgamated with a mafia organization. So here are a couple of differences. Instead of what you'd normally have in the board of a corporation, you don't have designated roles and definite positions, but just hierarchies of rank. So instead of having the CFO there and the COO there, you have got the number two and the number three and the number seven and number eight. And sometimes they're doing fairly consistent tasks, but sometimes the tasks just go on the merry-go-round. And what really matters in the end is the relative rank of the people on the board. And here's a second difference. In 2020, Vladimir Putin organized an illegal constitutional coup. So the CEO is there illegally. Moreover, the CEO got junior staff in the organization to go out into the world, find the number one candidate for the CEO position and poison him. The third point about this bizarre corporation mafia board takes us into the realm of the transition within the Kremlin and Putin's diminution in power. This is a time for an analogy within an analogy. Imagine a ship that's called Putin. It says Putin on it in big letters. And then imagine that the captain of the ship is Putin, and he has the formal powers of the captain, but he no longer is able to exercise many of them. In other words, the people milling around the captain, people of various different ranks, some with formal positions and some without, are now making many of the decisions that you'd expect him to make. And he acts as a kind of arbiter or referee in the conflicts arising in these groupings of folks around him. So the captain is formally the captain, but he doesn't have all the powers of the captain. And crucially, the ship is called Putin. And that's because even though Putin's power is declining and the conflictive clans around him are becoming more powerful, the symbolic significance of the office of president in Russia remains crucial because the presidency in Russia and therefore Putin is the only political institution that is regarded as legitimate by the population. So the people who are taking power away from Putin are doing so in a way that maximally preserve, preserves the symbolism of a Russia ruled by Putin.
The fourth feature of this bizarre board of a corporation and mafia organization is this. It's not just that the CEO is losing power relative to everybody around him. It's that everybody around the CEO is consciously and strategically planning for the CEO's departure. That's to say the actions that the clans around Putin are taking and the plans they're making are being taken and made in preparation for a world when Putin is effectively gone. Now, what does that mean? It could literally mean that Putin is dead or that Putin is in forced retirement. But it could also mean that Putin remains in the role of the, of the presidency, but with much less power. And it could mean that Putin is shifted into some other role where he has certain powers and responsibilities, but they're enormously emaciated. And so it's in this condition that the regime has sent 100k plus thousand troops to the Ukrainian border. And this is not just the condition in which the regime has sent 100k plus thousand troops to the Ukrainian border. It's because the regime is in this condition that it has sent 100k plus thousand troops to the Ukrainian border and we're going to talk about that now. So now, being aware of Putin's diminished power, being aware of clans around Putin strategizing for a world without him, we can now look at why Moscow sent all of these troops and weapons to surround the Ukraine. If we had to name a key goal of the regime creating this buildup of weapons on the Ukrainian border, we should say this. Anticipating its future vulnerability, the regime is trying to assert itself on the international stage when it is still invulnerable and stable enough at home so that it could get what it wants. So what do they want? They want to shape the international order in a way that's favorable to Russia. Here is the leading strategist for Vladimir Putin up until about 2012 and a man who is now a leading political commentator in Russia, Gleb Pavlovsky. What neither side in the negotiations is mentioning but both are aware of is the transit of power in Moscow. It has started and it is absolutely inevitable. Whatever happens and whatever choices Moscow makes, this process will terminate in a point of extreme vulnerability for the Russian regime. Before this happens, Putin wants guarantees of security. But if Russia believes that the current principles of security are unstable or unacceptable to Russia, will it abide by the new principles of security it wants to negotiate? No. Because the ideology of this regime is to be a disruptor and disrupt whatever are the principles of the international order. So are the Russians saying we want to negotiate new principles of the international order so that we can violate them? Yes, that's exactly what they're saying. Here's Gleb Pavlovsky again. They think of themselves as containing USA and the West via sudden and unpredictable actions which are designed in part to make them look crazier than they are. Now what is the method the Russians are using to pursue this goal? The method is very clear. It's threat of war. Here's Russian historian Nikolai Svanitsa who captures the Russian approach as talk to us or we will kill you. But now, why have the Russians acted out a stalemate? They created this big buildup of troops on the Ukrainian border, and then it seemed to be their turn to act, and they passed. Here is former US ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. I first met Putin in 91. I sat with him many times, together with Obama, Biden, Kerry. I have to say, 
I don't know what Putin wants. And those around Putin don't know what Putin wants. And I believe Putin has made no decision about his next steps. And he likes that, to leave the West negotiating its own internal divisions. And that happens. We start negotiating with ourselves. Paris offers something, then there is a distance between Germany and America and so on. And now you might ask, well, where are the Russian people here? Because we have said that the Russian regime is keen on not going radically against what the population wants. Here are the Russian people. Levada Center is the most reputable pollster in Russia, and to prove that, they've recently been designated as a foreign agent. And now look at this extraordinary poll. Only 1% of Putin's supporters blame the Kremlin for the escalation. And unbelievably, only 8% of those who disapprove of Putin blame the Kremlin for the escalation. And in total, only 4% of all Russians blame the Kremlin for the escalation. But there are many buts here. And without these buts, the poll could give us the wrong idea of what's really going on. The Russians answering this poll are talking about escalation, not war. There is no triumphant military mood available for the regime to tap into. Russians are not going to want casualties and they're not going to want the economic impact of a full-scale war with the Ukraine. Moreover, the support for the escalation is lukewarm and even the people who are in favor of the escalation the big majority are still kind of thinking well i kind of support this foreign policy stuff but the much more important things here at home are being messed up by our government that is corrupt incompetent and unacceptable and possibly even illegitimate and then there is another important consideration, and that's that if you stop a Russian on the street, they're going to straight away tell you they have four close relatives in the Ukraine. And that's going to be something else that's going to make a full-scale war with Ukraine feel like a completely crazy idea for the Russian population, a population that the regime is keen to not piss off too much. But what's the regime's thinking about its next steps? Well, it accepts that it can't piss off the population unless it absolutely has to. And the regime knows the mood of the population. That's to say, they know that what Boris Yeltsin used to call a zagagulina, that's to say a kind of adventure that's supposed to distract the citizens' attention from something that they're worried and complaining about, at least for a period of time, that that kind of zagagulina is not going to be effective now the way it may have been in the past. In other words, even though a full-scale war with Ukraine might garner temporary support, there will be no appetite for long-standing military euphoria that there may have been a few years ago. And there is this. Most people in the Russian regime remember Afghanistan. They're of their age. They were there and adults in the late 70s and early 80s. And what do they know? They know that there were food shortages in the Soviet Union, that life was tough, that you had to travel from one town to another to buy sausages. But they also know that the population was tolerating this up until Afghanistan. Afghanistan was central to the disintegration of the Soviet Union because citizens felt, look, we're tolerating all of this crap. But the idea that my kid who is 15 today, is going to be sent over there in three years to die for this regime? Excuse me, not happening. So Afghanistan really emaciated the perceived legitimacy of the Soviet regime. And folks who are in power now in Russia were adults back then, and they understand how an enterprise like that could impact a regime like theirs. But what are the considerations for a war with Ukraine that the Kremlin might resort to? Well, one is rather banal, and that's that if you make a threat many times over without acting on it, you put yourself into a questionable position. 
So the very act of persistently threatening and persistently enacting imminent invasions without going through might at one point push the Russians to go a little bit further. But the second reason is more important, and that's that Putin does, as we have seen, have a sense of mission, and Putin does have a track record of overruling warnings of massive deleterious economic impact if he is doing something that aligns with his long historical goals, goals that look at the historical destiny of Russia as he perceives it even beyond his lifetime. Let's not forget that in 2014, most of the people around him and everybody for whom he, from whom he asked for an economic analysis of a potential annexation of Crimea and involvement in eastern Ukraine. They all said, catastrophic economic impact, don't do it. And he said, thanks, I accept the analysis, but now your job is to minimize the economic impact of what I am about to do. What happens next? Number one, the fissures and conflicts between the different clans around Putin will multiply, dramatize and become more overt. Two, as the clans around Putin more overtly compete for power acquisition, they'll become more visible even to us in the West. And one thing will become clear, and that's that they are more radical than Putin they are less interested in containment than Putin, and they are readier to talk about turning the world to ash and nuclear war. Here is Putin appeasing them with a recent statement when he said that if there were to be a nuclear exchange, well, what's the point of the world existing anyway if Russia isn't part of it? У нас возникает законное право ответить. Да, для человечества это будет глобальная катастрофа. Для мира будет глобальная, глобальная катастрофа. Но я все-таки как гражданин России и, и глава российского государства тогда хочу задаться вопросом, а зачем нам такой мир, если там не будет России? Three, Russia will continue its policy of interference in Western democracies and its enterprise of destabilizing the politics of any Western country that's engaged in the sanctions regime against Russia. Four, and this is really the main consequence for the future, threats of war will become normalized, at least for Russia, as a means of doing diplomacy. In fact, threats of war may become Russia's only meaningful diplomatic tool over the decade to come. One of the best ways into Vladimir Putin's mind is actually via his obsession with Tsar Alexander III, to whom Putin has erected two statues. And that obsession started around 2015 or so. And you might say, what is this breathtakingly talented, highly functional Soviet hack slash bandit doing, being obsessed with a likable, lovable, masculine, physical, alcoholic, dysfunctional, out of his depth Tsar who contributed to world historical catastrophe without having the requisite sophistication so they could even blame him for it. And that is why I invite you to a fascinating future episode about Tsar Alexander III and Putin's obsession with him. Putin doesn't understand Alex III at all, to be honest. And that's going to be here. And until then, I'm going to place here an episode on Russiagate or some other really important matter about contemporary Russian politics.